question. Hi, everyone. We're fortunate to have Cynthia Bennett speaking today in the Atlas Institute Colloquium. Uh, we're just getting acquainted. She's currently a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University in the Human Computer Interaction Institute, also a researcher at the uh, a company we've heard of named Apple Computer. <laughs> And previously, she was at the University of Washington in the Human Centered Design and Engineering Department, formerly, um, what was it called? I'm spacing it. Uh, um, a, long, a long time ago, it was called TechCom, but that's been like a really, really long time. Is that exactly. what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Technical communication. Tech -com. Yeah. Tech -com. That's, that's been like 15 years, maybe, maybe more, Mark. <laughs> Leisha, Leisha, you're just betraying my age. I'm getting All right. <laughs> and my own. <laughs> like yesterday. Uh, and previously, uh, Cynthia did a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, minoring in African American Studies and Women's Studies from UNC Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and I'll stop there because we want to listen to Cynthia, not me. Go. Right. Hi, yeah, this is Cynthia speaking. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'll share my screen. And Cynthia also shared the PDF I posted in the chat. Yep. And I will be monitoring the, the chat. Um, so if you have questions, I would call on you and please introduce yourself before you ask questions. And your screen is shared. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen and Mark. Um, yeah, so thanks for that introduction. So I'll share a talk today called Informing an AI Ethics of Accessibility. And um, yeah, just as we already started to talk about, I'll share some accessibility and content notes first. So we're sharing a link to the slides in the chat. Um, they'll also be shared with the colloquium schedule in case you're in person and can't get to the chat. Um, and uh, the slides, I try to embed links in them. So if you would benefit from having a local copy for access reasons, or if you want um, quick links to several of the papers that I cite, that's a good document to have. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you need anything. I'm blind, so I won't be able to see your chat messages or your raised hands. So I think Ellen's gonna be helping to facilitate that. Um, and I'll do a brief, visual description of myself in case you can't see me. So I am a white blind woman with dark blonde hair worn down and I'm wearing a black shirt. And um, just as a final note, this talk has some discussions of ableism, racism, and transphobia. I'll let you know when this slide is coming up in case you would like to step away. So as an outline for this talk, I will share some background on my methods and on disability. And then I'll talk about two research contributions I have made. The first one is kind of a short overview of a framing that I've developed for accessibility research called interdependence. And the second one is a longer overview of an AI ethics and accessibility project I did around representation and alternative texts. And I will finish this talk with some future work. So broadly, my research goals are um, to firstly apply disability theory and activism to accessibility um, challenges. And um, first, I do this by understanding the impact of socio-technical systems, including AI-powered experiences, on people with disabilities, and to um, design ethical and inclusive experiences um, for people with disabilities in response. And to uh, work toward these goals, I have contributed to projects in several domains of accessibility research, including social media, um, navigation, novel interaction techniques, and education. But today, I will focus on projects in the areas broadly of design and disability and AI. So to do this broad range of projects, I use a variety of qualitative methods. So first I try to deeply understand people's experiences with methods from ethnographic traditions, including field work, conversation analysis, and interviewing. And in this process, I reflexively consider myself as an active participant in my research in line with feminist HCI, which builds upon legacies of interpretivist and critical studies. And when making interventions, I partner with communities of people with disabilities, and I use techniques um, from design inquiries, such as design probes and design workshops. 
So now I will go over some information about disability. So about 285 million people worldwide experience blindness or low vision, um, and I'll focus on the 35 million of them who are blind. And um, people who are blind use screen readers, which speak out displayed content um, and enable keyboard and non-visual gesture interaction on their computers and smartphones. And so that will be important later. And more broadly, about 15% of people worldwide have disabilities. And disabilities are mismatches between people's bodies and minds and the environments um, that systemically limit their full participation um, and occlusion. And disability is also a community culture and identity for some people. And I often, as I mentioned in my goals, guide my work with um, disability studies, which examine the meaning, nature, and consequences of disability. Disability studies prioritizes uh, the lived experiences of people who have disabilities. And this perspective is significant as before its inception, perspectives on disability in academia were primarily medical, emphasizing cure as the best future. So disability studies instead um, challenges the inherent inferiority of disability and embraces human variation. So now I'll transition to talk about my first project, which brings a concept from disability activism into accessibility research. So um, to talk about this framework, which I call interdependence, I need to explain independence. So historically, people with disabilities have not gotten to make choices about where they live or how they receive accessibility accommodations. And in the most um, egregious of situations, people with disabilities sometimes um, have been and still are institutionalized. And so thus, disability civil rights activism in the 1970s was called the independent living movement. And this activism asserted that people with disabilities have the equal right um, to, and they deserve to make choices about where they live and how they um, participate in society uh, or to become independent from state control. So independence has influenced accessibility research. So a lot of the motivation for technology development is to enable autonomy for people with disabilities. Recently, disability justice activism has kind of brought forth this idea of interdependence or the mutually reliant relationships that um, people engage in to work together to create accessibility. Um, interdependence recognizes that no one person is autonomous um, or dependent, but that we all kind of impact each other and can work together. And featured on this slide are three people, um, Mia Mingus, Patty Byrne, and Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasenga, who are activist scholars who've done a lot of the contemporary writing on interdependence. So I'll give an example of interdependence from a recent autoethnography that I co-authored with three other disabled women academics. So uh, my colleague Megan and I are both disabled. And so as I mentioned, I'm blind and I navigate using a white cane. Um, but sometimes when Megan and I walk together, I hold on to her elbow to receive visual guidance. Um, now Megan has a sync up or fainting disorder um, and certain environmental sounds like high-pitched alarms make her suddenly faint. Megan, um, kind of like how I use a cane, Megan has developed strategies to stay safe when she's alone. But when we walk together, um, she, you know, I kind of rely on her for visual guidance and she relies on me for stability. So in this example, Megan and I are interdependent. We are both contributing actively to our accessibility. And this um, perspective is not meant to kind of uh, erase the need for structural accessibility as the environment should be more accessible, but interdependence is instead meant to point out kind of the relational aspects of our accessibility. So, um, I argue that interdependence approach is generative for accessibility research. And this diagram kind of shows the difference between uh, kind of a predominantly independent framing in accessibility research, which tends to position technology as an assistive filling for people with disabilities. Interdependence instead recognizes relationships among people, technologies, and environments by studying the relationships um, and the ways that maybe you know, developments in technology can support um, rather than replace these important factors that work together. And so I will use this uh, framing when I go over my next project. 
So now I will transition to talk about representation in alt text, and I've further divided this part of the talk into two sections, so I will first begin with some background information. So image descriptions, commonly called alt text, um, alternative or alt text in web accessibility language, is one method to enable visual information access to blind people. So using a screen reader, if someone focused on this image, they would read the alt text, which says a crowd of people in a street, all sitting in wheelchairs, an American flag is held up in the background with stars in, arranged in the accessibility symbol. But many images posted online do not have alt text meaning if you can't see the image, you don't have access to it. And so this chart shows that about 0.1% of images posted on Twitter during a period in 2018 had alt text. So really, there's a really low rates of alt text. And um, AI or techniques for machine learning may be a solution to low rates of alt text by scaling its production. So in fact, several companies have released products which automate information access. And so this slide features apps from Apple, Google, and Microsoft, which use techniques from computer vision, machine learning, and natural language processing to translate pixels from images into text. And I would argue that so far, kind of the prominent approach to information access um, has been kind of from an independence framing. So that is, let's get as much information to blind users as possible. And this is really not a bad thing necessarily. It's very important um, that people have access to information. But in this um, talk, I kind of want to think about an interdependence approach to uh, designing alt text. So one that considers the impacts of factors like um, the alt text itself, the alt text users, how alt text is generated, like whether it was written by a human or whether it was machine generated, um, photographies or people who are pictured in photos, um, and kind of some of the environmental factors like history or bias um, that might be impacting how those descriptions are written. And these kind of factors, these interdependent factors are important because we have learned in previous research that blind people may actually over trust AI generated image descriptions. And so um, in some cases, the alt text might be their only source of information about visual content. Um, and in one study I co-authored, blind participants um, you know, trusted inaccurate AI generated image descriptions even when they were told that they might be wrong. And further, um, kind of uh, AI has known biases, um, which perpetuate gender, race, and disability discrimination, probably among many other things. So for example, machine learning models often classify just two binary genders, leaving out people who are non-binary and transgender. Um, often classification systems used to um, separate people into racial categories are antiquated or incomplete and narrow, kind of perpetuating uh, racist classification systems. Um, and also, we know that sometimes these systems work together um, in, in terms of having intersectional impacts. The Gender Shades pro Project is a very famous example where um, darker skin female appearing faces were recognized less often than lighter skin, masculine appearing faces. And regarding disability, there's not a whole lot of knowledge about whether how disability is even classified or um, whether it is kind of recognized in, in machine learning models. And this matters in my talk because um, some AI generated alt text already contains appearance information about people. And so this alt text from Microsoft's app, um, it's called Seeing AI, uh, it has given this person a gender and an age label. So um, you can kind of imagine that if a blind user happens to trust inaccurate information, they might not have another information source. Um, and in this case, they might be receiving inaccurate information about um, you know, another person. And appearance and identity, or what is popularly called representation, matters in US society. But are, um, 
we kind of predominantly share this information as communicated only visually. So let's consider this text description of uh, that is written about the musical Hamilton on Disney Plus's website that an alt text reader may encounter. It says, Hamilton has taken the story of American founding father Alexander Hamilton and created a revolutionary moment in theater, a musical that has had a profound impact on culture, uh, politics, and education. So now let's consider this image of Hamilton, cast members, and people who can't see the image might miss um, the fact that the cast is very racially diverse with black, Hispanic, um, and white actors. And so the language in the previous slide was very kind of hinting at this diversity, but not making it very explicit. And so, you know, people who are blind or reading all texts would not really understand the cultural significance of this play and not be able to participate as much in the discourse about that media. So throughout this talk, I will focus a lot on representation. And at times it, you know, it sounds like I am kind of breaking it down into very reductive labels around race and gender and disabilities. And I acknowledge that representation and our identities are much, much more complex, but I want us to think about how these labels kind of may manifest an impact in kind of textual interpretations of visual phenomenon. So now I will transition to talk about the project that I did. And um, it is called, it's complicated, um, negotiating accessibility and misrepresentation of uh, race, gender, and disability. And I do want to point out that to do this project, I partnered um, one of our collaborators is Morgan Sherman, who is a student at CU Boulder. So great to have their collaboration. And um, our research questions were, how does misrepresentation impact blind people's perspectives of alt text? when they are also marginalized based on their race and or gender? And what is their all text preferences when uh, for language to describe appearance and identity? Um, and then what is appropriate alt text when the authored by known contacts, strangers, or um, AI? Um, so I interviewed 25 blind people who also experienced marginalization based on their race and or gender. And so taking up intersectionality from contemporary black feminism, but black feminist theory, I knew that interviewing people who had just one touch point into the experience would not reveal the unique impacts. Um, and so I wanted to understand what are perspectives when people um, who are blind who uniquely benefit from alt text um, but who are also among people who are often uh, misrepresented in terms of being racialized or negatively gendered um, by the classification systems that kind of feed machine learning algorithms. Um, and so I kind of took up intersectionality based on kind of some of the slides I showed before where all text is just being rolled out, um, automated as quickly as possible, but then we have these kind of what I noticed separated conversations about um, AI bias um, and but not seeing those really touch the accessibility research arena. So my goal was to bring these conversations together um, and to focus on this, these intersectional perspectives. Um, so during the um, interviews, participants brought sample photos of themselves to anchor our discussions. Um, so I first asked them questions about their image browsing and posting behavior and um, their experiences being misrepresented. Um, both in real life and online to understand how does it feel or how's the experience when someone gets you wrong. Um, and then I asked them to describe to me context where they seek representation information about others, kind of thinking about that Hamilton example. And then we had a discussion about their preferred language to describe themselves when the person describing them is a stranger um, or someone that they know. And then we had a discussion about um, AI generated image descriptions and uh, bias. Um, so these tables show self reported demographics uh, make up the racial and gender makeup of participants. So every participant was a screen reader, a blind screen reader user. And I talked to several people who are non binary, transgender, and agender, and um, several people who are black, Asian American, and Latinx. And um, I will start um, by overviewing the findings 
um, by talking about the impacts of misrepresentation on participants. And so the next three slides have some racist and transphobic content. And so feel free to take a break for the next two or three minutes um, if you would like to not see that content. So a participant experiences being misrepresented varied from it being a microaggression, so not having a really big impact, but building up over time to contributing to dysphoria or a profound um, sense, state of kind of unease or dissatisfaction. So misrepresentation occurred outside the context of alt text, but it contributed to participant perspectives on alt text. And so for example, Sophie, has been misrepresented by blind people in person based on the way that she speaks. And so she said, you know, when blind people find out that I'm Indian, they'll be like, oh, I thought you were blonde or I thought you were a white girl. You talk like a white girl. And I think, well, what am I supposed to sound like? So Sophie's experiences being misrepresented by um, blind people in her own community um, helped her to kind of understand and have a perspective that sharing accurate information was extremely important to her. Other participants had been misgendered in image descriptions themselves, including Aqua, who said it's really off-putting because I put so much effort into informing people about how to make image descriptions. And so Aqua does a lot of advocacy in their community to encourage image describers to not assume gender. Um, and so their experience of being misgendered uh, was particularly hurtful to them. And uh, finally, some participants um, had used products that assigned a gender to people in images. And so Creo said, seeing AI, um, which is an app I showed on a previous slide, it tends to shove you into one characterization or another. So sometimes I'm a 35 year old woman looking happy or sometimes I'm a 50 year old man looking happy. And so these microaggressions um, for Creo were very frustrating and kind of helped contributed to them believing that they would really not be able to be represented by similar products. But participants agreed that representation information is very important. Um, and so some of them wanted the option to know this information all the time, understanding it to be embedded in societal interactions, whether it was made explicit or not. Um, so they wanted the same access as people who can see others. Um, but several participants kind of were concerned that kind of the nature of alt text and the fact that it is trying to convey the most important information, there might be more specific contexts where representation mattered to them um, more. So, um, so in one of these contexts, I'll go over several of them now, um, was when race, gender, disability was the topic of conversation. So several participants expressed that everyone in these conversations um, particularly them, they kind of reference a lot of online social media dialogue, particularly recently, um, where they weren't always sure where, where someone was coming from, if they were having uh, an, an opinion or making a statement about a topic and they wanted to know, you know, is this someone speaking from their actual experience or is this someone, um, you know, who's not? And so they felt like representation in, uh, information and image descriptions could help that kind of situated uh, knowledge. Others um, relatedly wanted to know more about representation in the media so they can make choices about what to consume um, or who to support and how they could understand kind of popular discourse like Hamilton. And some participants wanted to be able to read rooms and find community. And this also included online communities. So this desire often came from an interest in both staying safe, especially if they were in places where um, that were very white, cisgendered, or non-disabled centered spaces. Um, and also just to you know, be able to find community. If you think you look around a room, you see someone who seems to have something in common with you. That was an interest that participants wanted more access to. And finally, participants wanted to find certain perspectives um, or purchase certain products. And to them, understanding representation might give them some clues about, you know, is this actually a black owned business or are people with physical features that are similar to mine um, successfully using this product? So I have elaborated on just one of these contexts today um, with some quotes on the value of being able to read a room and find community and kind of some consequences when that is not a vis uh, available non-visually. So Yvonne said like, so we're about to talk about race and is the person that I'm talking to 
uh, a person of color, or are they more likely an ally? And I know that hits on all sorts of stereotypes, but sometimes I want to know because that can impact how vulnerable I am. So um, Yvonne wanted to be able to anticipate how her contributions might be perceived um, in, in order to potentially share them or modulate them um, in code switching. And, um, but participants, um, oops, sorry, I got lost in my notes. Um, and in another context, Kai talked about taking an online course and she reflected, you know, we all had to post a picture of ourselves to introduce ourselves. And I got an invitation to a black indigenous and people of color subgroup um, but I didn't have that option. I had to, you know, someone had to find me. And to Kai, this felt really unfair that she wasn't able to find as easily subcommunities within her course. So now I'll kind of going back to the research questions, start to go over some findings related to um, how, what are preferred language in different contexts and when um, the person writing the description knows someone versus when they don't. So previous experience with misrepresentation and contexts in which participants desired representation information kind of informed some of their preferences about language. And so identity descriptions kind of could be um, applied when the race or gender or disability of somebody could actually be confirmed by the person writing the alt text. Um, and these descriptions often kind of exceeded the purely visual perception into kind of culturally significant identifiers, such as someone who identifies as Black, um, but they were considered to still be kind of important and relevant for alt text, in, especially in those contexts I mentioned. Um, and participants said that in cases uh, where the alt text author doesn't know someone's preferred identity descriptors, it was pretty important that they didn't assume and they instead use appearance information like skin tone or clothing or hairstyles, accessories or access technologies. Um, they were perceived of as like potentially adding a little bit of detail and riches to the image description while avoiding assumptions. And I want to be really clear that these recommendations are not meant to complete appearance and identity, but to offer kind of some nuance and alternative when identity information is not available. So I will give some examples of a potential kind of description based on these participant preferences um, in different contexts. So here's a base image description. So a person with a filtering face mask uh, walks down a neighborhood street with one hand in their pocket and the other hand on their cane. They have a short mohawk and they're wearing a jacket, um, shorts, tennis shoes, and glasses. And the bracketed phrase, a person, will change throughout these examples. And I'll show how what factors from the interdependence diagram kind of contribute to the different choices for each of these contexts. So these um, first examples consider the human describer, um, the photography or the person in the photo, um, and the alt text user boxes in the diagram. And so if a human describer knows the identity of someone, you know, they could write a phrase like a black disabled non-binary person. But when the human describer doesn't know um, a photography's preferred language, then the alt text could describe appearance instead. So a person with dark skin. And so you'll notice that a uh, skin tone label has like kind of replaced a politicized racial identifier. And there are no gender or disability labels. And the accessory information later on in the alt text, such as the fact person has a cane, a short mohawk and a jacket kind of gives a little bit of information instead of the identity assumption. And um, participants really stressed also that in the next example um, kind of accounts for the broader audience. And so when the audience is known, um, participants were kind of understanding of these descriptions could get kind of wordy. And if you already know the person just replace that phrase with their name, so Layla. And um, when the kind of audience is very public um, to increase awareness of representation in the media, like if Layla were a public figure, the bracketed phrase could be Layla, a black um, disabled non-binary person so that a blind reader could start to connect Layla's name as a public figure with um, how they identify or appear. So next I'll talk about uh, participants kind of different perspectives of AI generated descriptions. 
of appearance and identity. And these findings draw on interdependent factors like the source of the alt text, the fact that it is um, in this case AI generated, the kind of alt text users such as blind people who may not be able to confirm information and may over trust um, machine generated alt text um, and kind of those environmental factors that I mentioned like history and um, bias. So uh, there were very kind of differing perspectives across um, participants. So some um, found alt text so rarely that they um, agreed with Parker who said, I favor something rather than nothing, even if some of these descriptions are wrong. And so thinking back to their graph where only 0.1% of images on, on Twitter had alt text, this was very compelling and, and also just kind of jarring that people um, you were willing to said that they were willing to potentially read misrepresentations of others or be misrepresented themselves because the state of accessibility is so bad. But others like Tracy kind of had a little few more concerns. Um, and so Tracy uh, talked about the labor of misrepresentation. And so um, Tracy said, you know, it's just one more microaggression that I would have to put up with from technology that's supposed to help. If every time I uploaded a photo, I had to um, change something so that didn't say age or misgender. And Yvonne kind of pointed out the like, AI's potential to perpetuate existing discrimination, um, explaining that you know the people who are probably often already bearing the brunt, uh, the people who are would be impacted are often already bearing the brunt of so much other stuff. Um, I just am already reading anti-Black messaging on social media, and that would be compounded if I was getting biased information. And so for Yvonne and others, um, this wasn't necessarily an issue of how to like de-bias or make uh, AI more fair, but just the fact that it's already been shown to perpetuate um, problematic harm is kind of a reason to really hold back and, and think about limitations. So um, for these participants, maybe you know we can start to think about what is an AI ethics of information accessibility kind of looking like for, for them. And um, kind of the first thing, several participants were very aware of AI bias and didn't have a lot of trust in manufacturers. And so, um, you know, kind of just again, I think a lot of us have probably elicited, you know, manufacturers um, need to build trust in these communities and help people to understand how these algorithms work and how their data is being used as they had concerns. Um, and next kind of AI generated alt text um, cannot know identity. And this was a pretty consistent um, perspective across participants and that that kind of factor they felt like really needed to reflect in the design of AI generated image descriptions. So kind of only using appearance language and that that's really tough because as we know, language changes. And so this kind of also brings up this idea of like guidelines and standards as kind of living things that we need to regularly update um, with kind of community input. And finally, AI generated alt text should be opt-in. Again, that was kind of perceived of across uh, participants as even if it could provide some benefit, allowing people to provide that consent. Um, and this is really important because often in accessibility research, we tend again to have that view of like, how do we make someone with disabilities more independent? And we might not always be thinking of the impact of the downstream um, that actually um, in enabling that access, we are making potential judgments about other people. And um, so there's kind of an opportunity to think a little more broadly in accessibility about these other factors that are being impacted. So um, kind of some of the design consideration, considerations we came up with are kind of making it easier for people to include visual information. A lot of platforms kind of bury these features in their designs. So we've seen some encouraging recent efforts to you know, surface pronouns. And then also kind of a need for more user education around like the difference between giving someone an idea of what the visual experience is without being pressured to disclose um, personal or unsafe aspects of someone's identity. Um, and again, allowing users to opt into AI generated descriptions and to choose kind of preferred language, which could then kind of be integrated into descriptions. Um, so I, uh, as it's mentioned, I also work at Apple and kind of in parallel, we've developed 
some machine generated image descriptions and it kind of came up of what how or whether we should include gender um, in these descriptions so i led an effort to have some focus groups with um, blind users also uh, lgbt users and then we have um, we were able to invite people there's a couple of advocacy organizations in the us that uh, actually are made up of blind uh, lgbt people at that intersection and so um, we decided that machine learning generated image descriptions are uh, will be gender neutral so the alt text for this photo is a person standing next to a uh, globe in front of a brick wall maybe cynthia so you'll notice that i was not assigned a gender label and i've um, tagged myself in my photos album so i opted into apple recognizing my face so to conclude this project description um, i hope that we can think about an uh, interdependence approach to alt text design kind of allowed me to consider uh, potential impacts uh, and, and multiple factors kind of at the same time, such as um, who, who is writing the alt text and their relationship to the people in the photo, um, as well as them being generated by AI and machine learning and the potential other biases and implications that arise from that. So now I will transition to talk about some future work in three areas. Um, and the first one is that, oh, hold on. So um, in my future work, I am interested in accessibility and representation kind of in other form factors. So I've focused on alt text, but AR and VR are proliferating. So as you can see, this is Meta's virtual meeting rooms. Um, but um, avatars, which is just one aspect of often participating in AR and VR, actually um, kind of might be difficult to create non-visually. Um, so even if they you know, might meet technical accessibility requirements, there's some really interesting questions around how to communicate different options for so that people understand it. So we kind of had mixed from the study I ran kind of had mixed experiences where some people uh, really liked Apple's avatar creators and people were very confused by it. So there's a lot of opportunity to further think about representation in this space. Um, so kind of some non-visual representation in AR and VR opens up a lot of questions about um, you know, are there, I can imagine like automation being used as a way to help people create their avatars and that kind of raises some tricky questions as I've already mentioned around representation and how well um, different models can represent and uh, interpret different people's appearance. Um, and I think there's also a lot of opportunity. I didn't talk a lot about um, disability representation today, um, but that's obviously another very necessary part of representation. Um, and also there's a lot of questions around how to facilitate uh, real-time communication of this information in potentially like very noisy or uh, like high sensory uh, environments where there might be different people moving. And so there's kind of this added dynamic aspect to just communicating information statically through alt text. Whereas in these environments, there's kind of these added factors that would complicate how this information should be communicated. So next, um, my next area of future work kind of considers automation in physical infrastructures. And so um, I didn't talk about this today, but I've done some work on micromobility, um, which are network small scale transportation technologies. Um, they're sometimes uh, automated, AI powered and semi-autonomous. And this research matters today because they're kind of across the United States, we're seeing that these automated vehicles are being deployed in public space, like these Kiwi bots I'm showing on the slide. And um, in some preliminary work, um, kind of building on the alt text work, we know that people are recognized differently. And this is starting to have impacts on the accessibility of public space. Um, so my colleague, Emily Ackerman, was actually blocked by uh, one of these uh, delivery robots that just stayed in the wheelchair ramp, the access ramp of an intersection, and she wasn't able to um, cross a, a street. So there's some pretty important questions about many, many areas of, of automation in terms of how they are being promoted as um, making cities technically innovative. Um, but they're kind of, kind of the like 
horrible irony is that many of these devices rely on accessible in infrastructure like wheelchair ramps, but then are now creating access hazards. Um, so in my um, future work, I'm really interested in working, I, I think kind of public infrastructure, technological advances are a great way to get community-based input on what kind of fairness, accountability, and transparency would look like in specific communities. And to really think about what would actually be an accessible and innovative transport te transportation technology for these communities. Um, whereas right now, kind of what we're seeing is highly kind of commercialized and highly unregulated um, deployments of these technologies, which cannot seem to interact with people with disabilities in respectful ways. And my third area of future work is on research infrastructures. Um, so accessibility uh, research is, or um, yeah, accessible research is kind of at the base of everything that I do as people with disabilities are kind of at the heart of my work. And it's really important that the, um, the, the academic community that's doing this research is also welcoming to people with disabilities. Um, but unfortunately, there's a fair amount of research that shows a lot of data collection and analysis tools um, and just the whole academic infrastructure is not very welcoming to research scholars with disabilities. Um, and so I am very committed to um, this work and I have done some preliminary documentation of how um, existing researchers who have disabilities already work to make their research environments accessible. Um, not only from like the human subjects perspective, but also from the researcher perspective. Um, so we, in our Kai paper we have upcoming, we've kind of distilled um, different aspects of facilitating uh, asset access in a research environment related to communication, materials, space, and time. Um, so I um, hope you will kind of follow me and you'll see when that paper comes out. Um, but I can kind of envision that after this formative work in the future, there's a lot of opportunities, um, engineering challenges in terms of how do we build tooling um, and technical infrastructures that are accessible for data collection and analysis, and also opportunities to kind of continue to understand opportunities to improve best practices and policies in academia so we can um, recruit and retain disabled scholars. So. Um, in conclusion, I hope that today I have um, demonstrated that disability theory like interdependence can inform information accessibility and technology design that accounts for multiple factors um, interacting and um, information accessibility like alt text is not neutral, but it's impacted by many kind of interdependent factors, including AI bias necessitating kind of continual ethical review of our accessibility work. And um, many, uh, all the people pictured on this slide are several of my collaborators over the past two years and um, also people who gave me feedback on this talk. And I've received funding from the National Sci uh, Science Foundation, Microsoft Research and several departments of the University of Washington. And um, thank you so much for listening to this talk. I'm happy to take your questions. Hey. Yay. 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 All right. <laughs>
and, and pretend that those those factors um, uh, don't matter, I guess. Um, how do you reason about the tension between those? And are there particular circumstances in which you would err on the side of um, of, of gendering um, by autonomous systems when there's uncertainty? Yeah, thanks for your question. I realize you do have to run. Um, that's a really interesting point that you're you're right, like maybe an unintended consequence of you know, machine learning descriptions being rather generic is then, you know, people might um, fall into their default assumptions. I, I think that's where I try, we tried to make an argument in this paper that representation is really important if machine learning is not maybe the way for that information to be elicited. Um, and so that's where kind of thinking about if it's possible for there to be hybrid information sources. I do recognize that robots moving around in the real world kind of puts a different challenge into that um, where um, the, I, I do kind of think about, I, I don't, I guess I don't mean to sound like a cop out, but I wonder if like part of our advocacy is, as designers is to kind of advocate for different social norms. So, you know, I gave a really brief visual description of myself at the beginning of this talk. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's kind of some place for that sort of advocacy in terms of um, in those types of interactions um, to, to bring in kind of that human, like, that, that human positioning. Um, but I, I'm really excited to learn more about your work and I am happy to continue the conversation if you wanna follow up. I know you have to go. I, I will, I'll follow up via email. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I have a question if I can pop in. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi, Cynthia, my name is Laisha Palin. I'm a professor of information science, um, a white woman with brown hair, black shirt like you, um, and I I look really tired and I feel really tired. So <laughs> <laughs> FYI, it's March. Um, so thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. I was thinking about, um, th this is such a hard problem, and just even doing this in um, an American context, which I just presume is the context that you're kind of, yeah. you're working in right now is itself difficult. I wondered if um, what you might be imagining or if you've been able to even yet imagine some of the cross cultural, which of course happens within the US, but I'm thinking, let's just, let's just, let's just imagine we're in, in other societies entirely. Are there, um, what does the ethnographic approach bring to you to enable you to think about um, the social constructs of disability and gender and identity and all those things as it might relate to these um, non-written or non-visual information representations that, that people need access to? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the answer you're looking for, but I, I think that it, it would serve as a guide for anything that we do, like the idea of, so as an example, um, Apple, we translate image descriptions. Now we produce them in multiple languages. And something we really quickly ran into is that in some languages, we weren't really able to figure out um, how to make gender neutral image descriptions, yeah. not only in the sense that like maybe they're um, not only gender neutral pronouns, but uh, profession words, we weren't able to find um, neutral words. And it was also one of those things where like, we kind of only had access to quote official quote dictionaries or whatever. So like activists are probably creating new language, but that wasn't right. available. So, um, so we like, I will be honest in the sense that I kind of backed away from that in this sense of feeling like I really, I, I don't want to say that it's not important, but in order to, to do that work well, we would have needed to do ethnographic work to understand what, what is the language that would be used in this context and not kind of just project our language um, in an in sort of some sort of like one-to-one -one translation. Um, so that is a really big challenge. The gender example is one of them. And I also think, you know, disability is another really interesting one as well, um, just in terms of, you know, there, there's just different ways that disability is talked about in different cultures and different parts of the world. And there are kind of disability pride communities in some, areas and there's you know not in others and so there that's another tricky one so yeah great thanks for your reflections on that I, that's all I was wondering was just okay. what what you know how deep does this go and and what you know, um and I, I imagine quite deep so anyway thank you so much for the work that you're doing yeah no thanks
I have a question. This is Robin Burke. I'm the uh, chair of the information science department. I'm a white guy with glasses and a beard and headphones today. Um, so my question is kind of about um, how how the provenance of of the text um, might be sort of labeled or made evident. So it's one thing if I'm looking at an image and I know it's been tagged by another human, I'm going to interpret what it says differently than than an AI. Um, but of course, you don't get that information when you're looking, you know, at all text is just here's the text, you know, here's the, what's associated with the image. And I'm wondering if that was something that, you know, your subjects found, like they wanted to know where the, does this image come from, or, you know, where does this text come from in relation to the image? And even if it's, you um, applied by a human, it might matter whether that human is an employee of Twitter or whether that, you know, that image, you know, mm -hmm. the, it's the person who took the photo, their labeling. Yeah. You know. So you make some really uh, great points that I didn't quite get into in this um, study. So one of the, I think, risks of, quote, natural language image descriptions is it will become harder for people to discern the root of the description. Currently, um, even state-of-the-art machine-generated image descriptions, participants were pretty like, oh, the Facebook ones always sound like this, and the Microsoft ones always sound. So they had like kind of such a simplistic grammar to them. But in the, the study I kind of collaborated on and showed where blind people over-trusted them, we kind of intentionally crafted them um, to be pretty humanistic, um, but they, they were still machine generated, but like there were full sentences. And I think you bring up some really good points around, you know, we see to combat misinformation, we see, you know, Google maybe tries to tell you the information source or whatever, and that's probably a necessary design um, consideration that would help um, people be able to identify where the alt text came from to then maybe raise healthy skepticism um, if necessary. So thank you. Taliesin, you're on. Hi. Hi, my name is Taliesin Smith. Um, and I work at the FET Interactive Simulation Project. Um, I'm a white woman. I have short hair, I'm wearing earbuds, and um, uh, a black and blue hoodie. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I just want to, um, you point out some amazing things about how hard it is just to write good alternative text for static images. And um, so much of our media is interactive and, I, and um, mm -hmm. that's what I work with. And, um, and we don't do automatic description of interactive description. So we have description designers that are trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, have you done it? Have you attempted to do any research yet in interactive media or? So I haven't. Um, so one thing I would say is I, this is a really good feedback of maybe an unintended consequence. I think, I think alt text is very achievable and people can learn to write it and it doesn't have to be, you know, your publication level. <laughs> I think just effort is really, you know, is, is a great, a great thing and it gets easier. Um, so, so I hope that um, maybe in revealing its complexity, I didn't make it seem like an impossible task. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as interactive media, I would recommend going to audio description literature. So I have seen um, in some cases with like theater um, where the audio description, so it's like an alt text, but it's a lot, it's a person speaking it um, during the interactive um, media sometimes they'll have like a guide where they you like they describe the different actors and their costumes and the different scenes um, as like an appendix. And then in the live audio description, they're using the minimal time to kind of focus on the actions. So that's kind of, I guess, an alternative, um, but it kind of does require someone to kind of step out of that experience. So, I, I don't know. Part of it is, I think, this challenge of how do you fit in the description? And then I think there's also an interesting way of flipping it and saying, okay, well, if 
description is important enough, how do we adapt the environment to like actually just embed that as um, maybe it's not an extra thing, but it's just kind of in the dialogue, you can craft, you know, it to just to be more descriptive. Um, so yeah, I haven't specifically worked in this area, but I would definitely point you toward audio um, description. And I kind of think of it a lot as like editing, you know, you write a draft of something and then you can kind of like edit to, to make it more efficient. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to say um, that. I, I mean, I have actually done a lot of work in this already. So mm -hmm. I do have a, a framework, but um, I was wondering um, more specifically about, I didn't ask a very clear question um, about representation and stuff, but um, uh, no, that's thanks. I have a, uh, um, uh, yeah, no, no, that, that's all stuff I look at already, but that's, that's really good, um, stuff. So yeah, sorry. I think my question wasn't very clear. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't answer what you were hoping. I do know in some kind of audio description communities, they really work with the, the writers and the actors to, to co-create those descriptions of people. Mm -hmm. Um, but I understand, you know, again, in interactive media that may not be, we may not be able to predict everyone who would be entering a scene. So I understand that um, that kind of forethought breaks down a little bit in your context. So I, I think these are really exciting questions and um, thanks for sharing that you're working in this space. I'll definitely have to look at what you're doing. So thank you. All right, thanks. We're at the end of the hour, but in case there's one more question that's waiting to be asked, I will silent, silently count to 10. <laughs> and at that point. Wait, wait, you're going to silently count to 10. Sorry, this is the Ellen. Now, now I have to ask a question uh, before we close it. So I, I never describe myself. I think I should say I'm Asian American, originally from Taiwan. So I have black hair and I'm wearing a maroon dress. And I put out a background with pictures of sketches drawing because I want people to feel that I'm playful. And so some of the things like over, since you're over your talk, I'm nodding my head. And then I realized <laughs> that you're not seeing me nodding my head. So I'm curious to think about what kind of other multimodal or tangible interactions, like when you're trying to read the room, right? So people yeah. on the Zoom, some turn on, some turn off, and then people are smiling at you right now how do we get that message to you? So as a speaker, you know, like we're not in our head, we're smiling at you. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about or working on this, any of this area? I haven't thought about that as much. I mean, it's certainly something I experienced in my personal life. Um, but if I was going to think about it, I would go to, um, so in deafblind communities, so deafblind people use tactile forms of sign language. Um, and there's kind of this new movement, it's called pro-tactile, where um, kind of a service provider, like an assistant, um, actually maps out, like if a, if a deafblind person is speaking, they'll like map out the room on someone's back and like have different ways of like tapping the person to give them information about like where people in the room might be raising their hand or might be responding. And there's the kind of these like mutually agreed upon like symbol systems, like tactile communication. Um, so that would be kind of the community, the pro tactile community that I would look at if we were thinking about creating maybe tangible devices that could um, provide similar information, but I haven't, I haven't embarked on this. It sounds really fun though. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to go, but thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank Jessica. Yeah, thank you so much. Jessica, are you asking a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm having a hard time uh, coming up with my question. My name's Jessica Dancing Heart. I'm olive skinned, and depending on where I am, people will describe me differently and make mm -hmm. different 
about uh, my race, my nationality, mm -hmm. my <laughs> place of origin in the world. <laughs> yeah. So I like to define myself as Earthling um, because <laughs> it seems like uh, a safe place. On Friday, we we had a talk um, by a professor from Colorado School of Mines and. And he reflected something that is true and that I think he touched upon, which is that people are aware that, you know, depending on who's doing the interpretation, what platform, you have a different interpretation that mm -hmm. is communicated and it's a function of who's doing the programming, right? And so it's a function of, of um, I think what goes on in, in life is is kind of funneled into technology in some ways. Mm -hmm. And the, the cultural issues of, well, what happens in, in a different culture or a diff different sub-society comes up. And mm -hmm. I guess I, I my curiosity is around how do we inform the technology and have the technology inform the people to kind of bring about more awareness and sensitivity? Does, I don't know if that's clear at all or the pondering is clear. Yeah, no, I hear um, what you're saying. And I think my first response is not related to your question, but something that came up um, that I didn't go through in the slides um, was just this tension of where like, rely like of so i i don't think that text is like a reductive form of imagery i think text can actually be quite artful and vivid but the way that alternative text specifically has been kind of marketed is like it needs to be this efficient brief description which then kind of relies on these labels and it's kind of it's like this tension that definitely i haven't resolved and participants were like well these things matter because it's become like kind of a source of oppression, right? So like there was kind of this tension between like, yeah, I want I want people to know who I am, but then also like, like the fact that I need people to know who I am is like kind of because I've been misrepresented and, and oppressed based on that. And so it was just this very kind of very tension to kind of hearing what you're saying, I kind of reminded me of that, um, that tension. So yeah, I don't how how technologies can make people more aware. I mean, I think as one thing is just, um, just even sadly, even moving the needle to understand that representation is important through different types of sense making, whether it's visual or non visual or other and um, to just em embrace that I think there's, there's this tension around like, uh, as an example, audio description best practices, like until very recently, I know people in the industry who have been told not to describe people's race or, or stuff like that. So I think even just moving the needle to, to make it not taboo um, for kind of visual interpreters to share such information. Um, but I, I do get stuck in terms of like, there is a risk that, you know, we could ultimately promote like very reductive ideas of representation based on the way that alt text is currently structured. Um, so I don't, I don't know, but I really appreciate all of your reflections and kind of for letting me reflect back. So. Thank you. It's a really big question. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. All right. So many people put in the chat say, Cynthia, thank you for the great talk. And they, they have some more to go. So they disappear without interrupting with some, sure. but just putting that. Uh, so on that note, thank you for the talk, the wonderful talk, and we are. We are right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me. You all have a good afternoon. You too. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.